Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm pretty happy to see that you guys have all built RAG solutions, um, but I'm actually here to tell you that maybe RAG isn't the end game. Agentic RAG actually is. And my name is Erica Cardenas. I forgot to introduce myself. I am a technology partner manager at Weaviate, an open source vector database. And in my role, I work with our partners and integration collaborators to build end-to-end -end solutions and share them in Weaviate recipes, which is our version of a cookbook, and then other mediums like this. All right, so here's an outline of my talk. I will be uh, first beginning with uh, vanilla rag versus agentic rag. So starting off with the basic retrieve, augment, and generate pipeline, and then go into how we can add layers to language models to make it agentic, and then obviously cover agentic rag and its benefits. And then I'll jump into the agent ecosystem, so how you can build these kind of systems with large language models plus function calling, and then also agent frameworks, obviously like llama index, but Luke just showed, and then adding observability to it. And then I'll end with generative feedback loops, so how we are building agents at Weaviate. Great, so let's start off with vanilla rag versus agentic rag. So here we have our typical uh, vanilla rag or naive rag workflow. We have our vector index, that's storing the chunks of your document, and it's stored in your vector database. When a, when a user has a query, it's going to go to the embedding model, and then we're going to do a semantic search. So we're going to compare the user query, the query embedding to the embeddings in our vector index. Then, obviously, we'll augment it now. So we'll take the relevant context along with the prompt, and then we'll send it to the language model. Once the language model has the relevant context along with the uh, prompt, then it will output a response to the user. Is this something what we've all built when building RAG? Is it hands? Yes, yes. great. <laughs> cool, so then in summary, we have the retrieve, augment, and generate a very standard pipeline. So now we want to add more components to a language model to make it agentic. So of course we have the agent, which is the language model, but then we also want to add the memory. So we have the short-term memory, which is the context window. Um, for some models it varies. Uh, I think like Gemini has like two million if you're not on the wait list, but the context window varies. Uh, but then you also have long-term memory, and that's the conversation history that you have um, with your users using your application. In addition to that, you also have planning. So now the language model can say, hmm, how should I approach this answer um, the best way possible to answer the user's query? Um, so it has some like kind of reflection and like you can use chain of thought or even uh, react to, to achieve this. And then of course we have tools. So you can have your vector database collection as a tool. You can also have a calculator. Um, it can access the web, uh, but then you can also give it access to your Gmail account or Slack if you would like. So in summary, what makes up an agent and kind of the layers around the language model is the memory, the planning, and then the tools. Great. So now I want to cover, really just focus in on the, um, how you can build agentic RAG with React. So React is an iterative framework that is used, uh, that can do decision making, but also make uh, action-based actions based off of the uh, user query. So you have the large language model, and it's going to think and reason about the user question. So it can even do the routing to a specific tool if it needs to. It can break down the complex query into subqueries. It's kind of just kind of having a thought process, I guess, if you will. And then it will then perform the action and then observe its current state, and then it will just iteratively loop until it either has enough information to answer the user question or simply just uh, stop if it has enough information to answer the question. Okay, so in summary, React is a it has a thought, uh, it can reason about the action to take based on the user query, um, then it takes the action, then it observe, observes its current state, and then it will loop as it needs to. So I wanna start or share an example of where vanilla rag actually fails. 
So here I have my query summarize the last conversation I had with Connor. If I were to pass this into a basic RAG pipeline, my query is sent to my vector search engine, and it may retrieve my uh, conversation between Connor and I, but it doesn't know that I want my uh, our latest conversation uh, because that's not in the context. It knows that I'm chatting with Connor, but it doesn't have the date or information that will show that it was from uh, like my last conversation. So actually, where we can make this more agentic and where this succeeds is that it can access my Slack messages directly because I've defined it as a tool, but then also it can access my database collection. So I have, if Connor and I are talking about Weavate features, hybrid search and multi-tenancy, and my database collection has uh, content from the Weavate blogs about those two features, it will retrieve information from both, both sources and then combine it into one coherent answer to give me that summary of the last conversation I had with Connor. So of course, the benefits are that it's able to format the search query from the prompt. Um, so like similarly, like with a query router, it's able to format the search query. Maybe it wants to add metadata filters or it wants to do an aggregate query rather than a vector search query. It understands and it understands the intent of the user query. Um, it's able to call tools in parallel, so like my Slack API, but then also my vector database collection. It can navigate your database, so hit two different collections if it needs to, uh, do a vector search plus a filter query or even a hybrid search query if needed. And then it can iteratively search. So I showed React and how it just goes through an infinite loop until it feels like it, like it has enough information to answer the user query. All of these four, all of these are four benefits of agentic RAG, but obviously with anything good, there's some bad to it, um, but actually, I uh, guess this, the limitations that I have written down uh, were before I saw the new uh, features and research that has been going into agentic optimization. So obviously we have latency. I think when people hear agentic rag, it's like, oh my God, it's gonna be so slow. It's, you know, it's going through this loop until it satisfies the user's question. So I guess that is a concern, but I guess there are optimization techniques that are going into making these systems run even faster. And then, of course, you have the inference costs. So you do have to pay for each inference that you're making to the language model. But hey, maybe you want to fine tune an open source model, and now you don't have to pay to make the inference calls because your model is open source. Uh, so then, you know, to prep for this talk, I was like, why not compare vanilla rag to agentic rag? Uh, so we ran a little benchmark off of 45 Weaviate FAQs uh, taken from the Weaviate blogs. Um, so here are just like three query examples. So I guess we have blog posts about BM25, Langchain, and then like uh, comparing vector libraries to vector databases. Anyway, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is, is that agentic rag actually won 34 times in comparison to vanilla rag. And that's because it knows how to understand the user intent of uh, uh, the user's question. And it can navigate my database to say, oh, I need to go to uh, this collection or I need to run my query multiple ways or format my search query to get the best response. And the link on the bottom, I will show Weavate recipes at the end, and you can try it out for yourself if you would like. Okay, so now obviously I wanna talk about exploring multi-agent systems and how we can incorporate roles and routing and sharing and isolating uh, different tools to the agents. So here we have our query again, and this is just a single agent system. It's gonna go to the language model and the language model is going to say, oh, okay, I need to access the information that is stored in collection A, or it can say, I actually need to go to collection B, or it's a math question, let's go to the calculator, or the database doesn't have enough information and there's new information that I need to access, let's go to the web. Once all the information is gathered, it's then sent to that last language model to produce the response uh, back to the user. So in summary, we have the retrieval agent that accesses the external tools, and then we have that last language model to generate or summarize the answer that is sent to the user. Okay, but now this is the multi-agent part of it. So again, we have our query, 
and we have the top level agent. Now, what we can do is have a multi-agent system where each one has its specialized, it has a specialized tools and a role within this agentic uh, system. So we have uh, virtual uh, agent A is responsible for the different uh, database collections. Agent B is responsible for retrieving new information in the web. And then agent C can access other tools like Slack and Gmail. What's really cool about this kind of pipeline is because not only can the tools be called in parallel, but also each one has a specialized focus because if you go back to, oh gosh, if you go back to this example and we just load up the retrieval agent with a lot of tools, there's a high chance that it's gonna select the wrong one and then it's gonna go in that iterative loop and now it's taking too long and it wasn't necessary. So I'd say latency is another benefit of kind of a multi-agent retrieval system, but then additionally, Retrieval uh, agent A, B, and C can all have access to different language models. And I think, you know, that like having language models that are specific, um, that have domain specific knowledge is really important and kind of reduces the error and hallucination that it can produce. So that is again sent to the last language model to produce the output. And then there is the response back to the user. So we have the top level, top level agent. The uh, sub-level agents will call the re uh, required tools. And then, again, we have the language model at the end. OK, so that was kind of like the backstory of agentic rag and how it differs from vanilla rag. But I now want to talk about the agent ecosystem and how you can achieve this either through LLM plus function calling or use agent frameworks. And then, of course, adding observability um, like Arise with Arise. All right, so here we have Gemini, and it obviously supports function calling. Have we all used it? Great. <laughs> okay. So here we have an example of a calculator tool. And uh, this is just like one JSON example that I would, uh, wanted to share, but obviously this could be any tool that you define. Uh, so what's happening is the user sends the query, and Gemini is given all of the available tools that it can select from. It'll say, oh yeah, this is a good query for a calculator. It sends it back to your application, and then your application will need to call the tool, and then you will send the output of the, uh, from the tool back to Gemini to form that final output. No fancy visual here, but that's what's happening underneath the hood. OK, so then we have come to agent frameworks. And obviously, Luke did a great job with explaining the different tools that Llama Index has. But we also have a DSPy. It supports React, uh, which is that uh, reason and act uh, kind of framework that I had shared earlier. And then it also has Avatar for prompt optimization. We also have Leta, which is a new framework for updating agent memory. So it really uses that short-term and long-term memory. And it does like a, a variety of things to update the uh, language model's memory based off of conversation history. And they just released a new course with deep learning AI. Then of course we have LangChain with their expression uh, language. And then we have LangGraph and their other tools. And then of course we have uh, Crew AI for their multi-agent orchestration systems. And then you really need to understand what's happening under the hood. And I actually stole this from your blog post <laughs> on Autogen, uh, but Jason did a great job with showing uh, Phoenix and just Arise and all the amazing uh, things that they have built around uh, tracing language monocles and systems. And again, this is just an overview of what the AI agent stack looks like. This is released from Leta last week, I believe. Um, so they cover everything from observability, the vertical agents, the frameworks, the memory, the storage, obviously with Weave 8 being not the only one there, but to me it's the only, only one there, um, and then model serving, et cetera. There are a lot of logos here, but the link is on the bottom, and I definitely recommend checking it out. Let's see if you. Um, so actually at Weaviate, we have this same uh, stack or like kind of thinking we have for what it means to make an AI native application. So of course you have your vector database, but you also have your data platform, so getting your data into Weaviate. You have your frameworks, you have the model providers, you need the compute infrastructure, and of course you need the cloud hyperscalers like Google in order to build these kind of applications. So. <laughs> 
one way to communicate this in the ecosystem that is all around us with building an AI native app is actually through Weave 8 Recipes. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. Not only do we cover Weave 8 features, but we also cover our integrations. Um, so we have LLM frameworks in there and then all of the other like subsections that I just highlighted on the other slide. And now generative feedback loop. So this is actually how we are building agents at Weaviate. So I'll go over the API design and then just a few applications that you can build using GFLs. So this is actually what the API will look like. Um, we're very close to getting this out, so I guess a little sneak peek. Uh, but we are taking, we, uh, with GFLs, you're able to create uh, new content using language models, and then you can store it back in the database. So here we have an, an instruction to create an overview of the content. It's going to grab the blogs in my Weave 8 database, and then it's going to summarize or create an overview and store it in a new property called overview. It's pretty straightforward. I think it looks very nice and easy to understand, so it will be in your hands soon enough. Uh, so a few applications for GFLs is obviously you can take all of the data that's stored in your database and then you can clean it. So if you're just using your database to dump a whole bunch of data, but then you want to add kind of a way to understand it and do like a or research over it, um, you can do that using GFLs. Um, you can also do uh, chunking. You can also chunk uh, text documents. I think Anthropic released uh, semantic chunking. I think has anyone done that? Seen it? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> um, so you can use GFLs for that as well. So it can see the whole PDF, and then I'll say, okay, let's group page one and page two together for PDF because they are semantically similar, et cetera, et cetera. Also, you can generate synthetic data if you wanted to uh, for data annotation or even model training uh, to fine tune open source models. And then here's just a visual of what it looks like. You take your query, you go to your vector database to retrieve those relevant uh, objects, you pass it on to the language model, it will generate um, the outputs and then it will store it back in your vector database in a new property or maybe do an update to the properties that you already have. And the reason why I thought this would be important, uh, Langchain last week, I believe, the AI agent space is moving really fast, actually. So sorry I'm making so many references, like information overload. But um, they actually found that uh, the most, the best tasks for agents are actually through research and summarization. And this really ties back to that limitation that I had touched on previously of the latency. If you're building an agentic rag system, I do think you don't want to use or build it for applications that require quick responses. I think, you know, rag and adding on like a query router or even just like doing vanilla rag would be pretty sufficient. Uh, but with agentic rag, it's really important. It, you, well, I guess with building a genetic rag, you need to prioritize the response, uh, the quality of the response. And, you know, you, in order to produce a thorough research or report of some topic that you were asking it about, you want to build an agentic rag system under the hood. And we, uh, uh, Stanford actually had a framework release called Storm, and it was able to spend like two hours on the web doing enough research to produce a thorough output. Um, so that goes back to the, uh, yeah, sorry, what's happening here? Yeah, goes back to the research and summarization. All right, so here's a summary of, the, of my talk. I, gave, I compared vanilla rag to agentic rag. I covered the agent ecosystem and how you can build agentic uh, rag today. And then I covered generative feedback loops. Okay, here are a few resources. My colleague, Lina, and I uh, wrote a blog post I was on the uh, Weave 8 podcast to talk about agentic rags, so basically everything I just talked about today. And then, of course, we have recipes um, in the integrations folder. Uh, we have an LLM framework subfolder where you can check out a whole bunch of different recipes. And that's all. Thank you.